let's just look at this quote for a second. It says, the capacity for estrogen formation in the blastocyst has been documented, and it is speculated that the estrogen surge is a fundamental feature of the implantation of the blastocyst. In this regard, it is noteworthy that whereas enzyme deficiencies are known for virtually all steroidogenic enzymes, a deficiency in aromatase, the pivotal enzyme in estrogen formation, has never been found. Perhaps this enzyme deficiency is incompatible with pregnancy. Now what in the world did that mean? Okay, well let me, let me explain what this is saying here. Well the key phrase on there is incompatible with pregnancy. Now what that is saying here is this. A blastocyst, that's when sperm meets egg and that makes one single cell and as those cells begin to divide, and I know you remember this, the sperm generally meets the egg where? In the fallopian tube. And as that little ball of cells floats along the fallopian tube and it's heading towards the uterus and it wants to implant in the uterus, that little clump of cells by scientific talk is called a blastocyst. And in order for that to implant in the uterus, inside mom's body, she has to have a surge of the female hormone called estrogen. Now, how many of you like estrogen? Come on, gals. I mean, you've got to be a fan of estrogen here. It's, it's what makes women like women. It makes you develop into women. It makes you look like women. It makes you think like women. It does all of those things there. And in order for that blastocyst to implant in the uterus, Mom's body has to have this surge of estrogen right at the time it has to implant. Well, there's an enzyme that makes estrogen, and it's called aromatase. That's the enzyme that makes estrogen. And it's saying in this slide here that throughout time, we can find deficiencies in a lot of enzymes, but they've never found a single deficiency in this enzyme because if this enzyme was deficient, it would be incompatible with pregnancy. And if it's incompatible with pregnancy, it's incompatible with life in general. Do you see? Because you have to have pregnancy in order to get the next generation. And if women can't get pregnant, then that, brought a, that would bring a pretty quick end to Adam and Eve. Right then. You would have Adam and Eve and no Steve. So that would be over. <laughs> so you, this particular enzyme has never, ever noted to have a mutation in it. Because it would stop pregnancy. Right here, you can live with a lot of them, but you can't live with this one. So this enzyme here is, com is absolutely fundamental in order for pregnancy to take place. And if you don't have it, it's not going to work. So the question would be to evolutionists, hmm, how many times of trial and error through random genetic mutations did it take to get this enzyme, aromatase, to evolve? Because if it doesn't evolve, no pregnancy. See, it's a showstopper right then and there for evolution. You need that enzyme, and there's no chance, no chance to it evolve through trial and error over and over again. Make sense? All right, there we go. Now, let me just clarify one other thing. When I'm talking about evolution here, and this is what you need to do when you talk about evolution, you need to pin them down on their definition of evolution. I'm not talking about, you know, uh, resistance to antibiotics by certain bacteria. I'm not talking about the variations in the length of a finch of a, you know, a finch beak or any of that kind of stuff. I'm talking about right here. Take it right from the National Association of Biology teachers so nobody can accuse me of having a, a pet definition of my own. And it says here that the diversity of life on Earth is the result of evolution. That's what I'm talking about when I talk about evolution. Exactly what evolutionists mean that the diversity of life on Earth has evolved. And of course they say it's an unpredictable and natural process of temporal descent with genetic modification that is affected by natural selection, chance, historical contingencies, and changing environments. Now one thing you see a lot of in their definition is chance. You see a lot of historical contingencies. And you don't see any words at all alluding to design plan, purpose, or designer. And that is a major difference in our difference in view between evolution and ourselves. We don't put a lot of stock on chance, historical contingencies, and changing environments. We do put a lot on design, purpose, planning, forethought, and reason. 
And I'm suggesting to you that is a better description of what we see in the biological systems than chance and historical contingencies. So when I'm talking about evolution tonight, that's exactly what we're talking about. Well, do followers of evolution really interpret the uh, literature impartially? Well, look at this. Look at this quote, and I'm sure many of you have heard it before, by Professor, Professor Richard Lewontin. He's a Harvard University geneticist, and when I was a student at Harvard, I never got a chance to meet him, but he was there, even though I made opportunity, I tried to get opportunity several times. And he stated this. We take the side of science, and of course when he says science, he's thinking of evolution. In spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories. What an, what an admission. What an admission. You know, that they are tolerating all of this stuff right here. Because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism or naturalism. That's what they're talking about. They're committed to that. It is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal, of the, of the phenomenal world. Now, that's another tremendous admission. He's saying there's nothing in science which is forcing us to have this materialistic view. And that's true. I'm a scientist, and there's others in this audience here that are scientists, and I don't hold to a materialistic view. And I function in my medical profession quite fine. And when I was an engineer, I functioned fine, even though I never believed in this. And there was nothing about science that forced me to believe it. He says this, but on the contrary, we are forced by our a priori commitment to adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Moreover, that materialism is an absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Now, is that an impartial, unbiased, open-minded, searching for the truth, take whatever the evidence says kind of outlook on life? No. There is, is, these people are more closed-minded than they would ever accuse a, a creationist of ever being.